Elastic Security empowers security teams everywhere to prevent, detect, and respond to threats quickly through a unified solution. And it's free and open, putting you in control. Use Elastic Security to eliminate blind spots by analyzing all of your data, no matter its volume, format, or age. Stop threats at scale with automated threat and anomaly detection, and arm every analyst with fast search and integrated case management. Download or try Elastic Sim for free and experience the benefits of an open security solution backed by world-class security research at securityweekly.com forward slash elastic. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at Security Week weekly.com forward slash ACM. Oh, welcome back everyone to Falls Security Weekly. This uh, segment is being recorded. I'm in the bunker. So I mean, get used to that backdrop. Uh, it might change. Um, but for now, I'm in the bunker and uh, would like to make an announcement. Our next webcast on September 10th will teach you how to extend the enterprise network for remote workers and protect your home network. Learn how to plug security holes required to meet a zero trust security model on September 17th. Securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to register for our upcoming webcast and securityweekly.com slash on demand for the previously recorded ones. Mr. Tyler Robinson and Lee Neely are on the lines remotely. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Good beer. <laughs> nice to have you. So. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guests to talk about um, very much about vulnerability prioritization, which is still a sore spot, I believe, in uh, our industry today and with many security professionals. Here to do that is Roy Cohen, currently the co-founder and VP of sales for Vicarious and a cybersecurity expert with over 15 years of experience, former research team leader at CyberArk, penetration tester and graduate uh, of elite technology unit at IDF. Roy, welcome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, and great to be here. Shani Reiner is here with us as well. She has 10 years of experience working as a cybersecurity researcher and data scientist. Her malware research has led to the development of the industry's most advanced analysis tools. Shani holds a, a BSc in computer science and an MBA specializing in finance strategy entrepreneurship, both from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Shani, welcome to the show. Hey, Paul. Very excited to be here. Yes, this is. Uh, I'm excited about this segment because I really believe I'm excited to be working with uh, Vicarious because vulnerability prioritization, patching, all of that stuff is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think it's you know time for a lot of different shakeups in in this particular arena. Um, Roy, I want to uh, just uh, kind of go over to you and Shani and, and talk about. Um, kind of your approach in general to uh, vulnerability identification um, and prioritization. Great. Uh, thanks, Paul. So actually, um, we thought about today to discuss a bit about um, how to uh, predict vulnerabilities and also first, what's the importance and motivation for doing so. Um, as we know, vulnerability, let's call it management, is manually relies on uh, past exploitation, past vulnerabilities. It means that there is a vulnerability which was disclosed somewhere in some point in the past. And upon such disclosure, a company gets in some way some notification and then it needs to take an action. Um, but if you recall, you know, historically speaking, uh, I think the CV concept was kind of introduced in uh, 1999. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, by that year, there were like only a thousand vulnerabilities uh, uh, published that year. Um, getting, getting to today, there are over a thousand vulnerabilities disclosed every month. So, so I think there's like a, quite a straightforward motivation to why to try to find vulnerabilities beforehand, like before hackers do. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, Roy. I, I got that introduction, like not completely wrong, but uh, pretty wrong. I apologize. We are going to talk about predicting. Uh, which is an aspect of prior, I mean, is basically prioritizing what you didn't previously know about that hasn't been disclosed, correct? 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. So imagine, uh, again, we are pretty confined to the concept of a, a, a software is vulnerable only upon a public disclosure. And up until that point, it's considered to be safe. But it doesn't really matter. You know, every vulnerability that is disclosed uh, these days, uh, probably the application was, was used before. So um, unless there is a public disclosure, we still believe applications are considered to be safe. Um, and because of the increase of, you know, threats and, and vulnerabilities, and also... Um, automated techniques to find vulnerabilities, uh, we think and we feel what we try also to do somewhat of an education is to uh, help companies to know beforehand if they are using a vulnerable application based on binary analysis, uh, based on you know examining the compiled code and see if there is like inner threat which may in turn be used against them. Um, so I think that the, the vulnerability management today, which is kind of confined to things which are you know, prior knowledge, um, should be you know shaken a bit, uh, and companies should be aware if there is at least something which, in terms, may be compromising their in their network. So Roy, I mean, basically, you've taken a security researcher with Ida Pro and turned them into an AI bot. I mean, that's kind of a, a very sensational way of saying what, what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Imagine having a reversal uh, sitting 24-7 trying to find stuff across uh, applications you are using, even proprietary. You know, probably mm. um, the vast majority of, um, of scanners will be, again, confined to um, applications which are probably well-known off the shelf for operating systems, not necessarily to applications which are customized or, or you know, proprietary software. Um, and, you know, let alone applications which are obsolete, you know, eventually a vendor at some point in time says, you know, this application is no longer maintained. And, you know, a lot of customers all over the world are still using the application. So now what question is being asked? How do I know it's, there is something here which in turn can be used against me? So trying to look, you know, into the future and not be confined to known uh, to CVE concept or non vulnerabilities. this is like uh, the big story we're trying to tell here. Roy, what kinds of things are you looking for in the binary analysis um, to determine that there's a vulnerability? Um, so before we skip to that, actually, we, we heard some some exciting stuff for you. Um, so we got some. We would like to do some uh, um, to go through an exploit together um, based on the time uh, limit that we have during the session. But we'll do some analysis mm -hmm. together. Um, we're going okay. to analyze to, to some extent how it's being done manually. Um, then we would like to discuss how we can scale that and in, in the end uh, of the session, we're going to show like what the cars are doing, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to turn over to Tyler and Lee as well um, and have them ask some questions because I'm sure there's some questions burning on your mind now. Uh, yeah, this is, this is pretty interesting from a, <clears throat> from an exploit, uh, like predictability standpoint, like there are known, uh, malicious kind of key indicators that a lot of exploits or vulnerabilities end up leveraging. But um, the ones that are, are typically like living off the land or abusing certain functions, does this have the ability to kind of identify uh, the misuse of, of common tactics as well? Or is this simply looking for exploit paths with inside of an application, an OS, uh, a piece of software? Well, when you look on the spectrum over uh, how, um, you know, how a vulnerability uh, can be found on binary, you have multiple ways, uh, and we're going to describe them. Um, so some of them are like what you've mentioned, to the ability to identify like um, pieces of code or like snippets which uh, are known to be ex exploitable or potentially can be exploited under some certain circumstances. Um, so yeah, these are, uh, speaking about Vicar, so yeah, these are kind of the things we are also looking for. Does it also identify like libraries and stuff that are being leveraged with inside of the binaries or being called functions being called from inside the binary? Precisely. So what we are special, uh, specializing is that uh, we actually analyze the binaries uh, level vulnerabilities rather than, I know there are plenty of tools to do it on the web uh, application level. Um, we are kind, kind of specializing on the binary level. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so are, are you just uh, analyzing the, the static binary or are you doing something in a detonation chamber, or a little both? Yeah, so it's actually a good point, Lee, because uh, obviously uh, analyzing, uh, statically analyzing the banner can, give you, can get you to some point. Obviously, we have obfuscations and behavioral, you know, environmental kind of uh, uh, variables which should be met. Um, today, we are focusing on, on stack and ana static analysis, but we're always extending the portfolio of things that we support. Yeah. 
And I know it's non-trivial, so you got to start somewhere. Um. Yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, we want to, you know, we want to find everything, uh, but you need to start at some point, and you know, and extend from there. Well, <clears throat> please identify all the unknown bugs before we go to production. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> will do will do and it's um, interesting too these binary the binary analysis uh, it doesn't matter what operating system or processor architecture right if you're looking for the exploitable functions that can be independent of any kind of architecture or uh, what operating system was built for right yeah precisely and imagine um imagine every every vendor is acting to some extent like an island so they are getting like uh let's say there's a uh Responsible disclosure, they're getting like an insider is a vulnerability in one of their applications. Um, and they're fixing it, okay? They take an action, they fix the, the vulnerability, but the technique can be used for other vendors, maybe other vendors also in the same space of, of applications. Imagine a database application. So some vulnerabilities that we also uh, identified, we saw the snippets, the vulnerable snippets of code can be used on other uh, database engines. So wow, imagine, now, Roy, okay, you're being you're being too kind. Typically, when they fix one bug in one piece of their own <laughs> software, right, that exploit path is in two or three other places, and oftentimes they miss that, which I find amazing. Microsoft yeah. has even missed that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to mention any vendors, but yeah, that's precise. Uh, there is a a common phenomenon where there is like a, a release cycle of patches to reverse it to see what was changed and then to search for these kind of bugs in other locations in the code. So you're yeah. spot on there. <laughs> right. Uh, so most of the bypasses is, work, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And but it's interesting that uh, your software, Roy, uh, in Shani can detect this, right? And even uh, and we'll talk about virtual. I hate the term virtual patching, right? But put a remediation out for it because that's I think a really interesting scenario. Yes, there's a major bug that's been released and there's been a patch, but now the eyes of all of the evil people who are writing exploits are on this code and they're going to find instances of it and you're going to be a target pretty quickly. So having your technology, I think, puts you in a really good shape for this, particularly this scenario as well as lots of other ones too, but it's kind of interesting to think about it in this context. Uh, yeah, uh, likewise. And, uh, you know, if we are... Uh, to get our hands though, it would be great to show like uh, how um, again how vulnerability is uh, um, is detected. Um, first, we would like to show an exploitation, and then how vulnerability is going to get detected. And uh, of course, then we can discuss about how to scale that. Of course. Yeah. No, I think that's great because I think uh, when I was first hearing of this, I'm like, oh yeah, like I used a really ghetto way of just running strings against the binary. And if I see stir copy. <laughs> You got a buffer overflow, <laughs> right? I'm sure it's a lot more complex than that, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. There is a lot of uh, uh, things to to place there because, again, um, let's say open source tools or things which are kind of uh, result of um, short term projects are can get you to some point, but it does require to be a bit more precise. Eventually, unless you want to bombard your client with uh, tons of alerts, uh, you need to 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 focus. You need to do to some extent validation. Uh, so yeah, there is a lot more into that than just showing a, a, a known to be malicious string or a, a sensitive function. Right. So, okay. Well, if you want to shift to the demo, I think that is a good time to do that. Yeah. So Shani, I think the the floor is yours. Thanks, Roy. Um, so as uh, Roy mentioned, um, every month there's over one thousand vulnerabilities that are discovered, and one of them uh, lately was discovered by Stefan Schiller. Um, and he discovered a format string vulnerability in an AnyDesk 552. Um, this vulnerability can be used to gain remote code execution by sending a single UDP packet to the target machine. So let me uh, share my screen with you and we can test this exploit for ourselves. Okay, so first we will um, set up the attacked host. Mm. So the host is Ubuntu 18.04. Uh, I already uh, um, downloaded the AnyDesk 552, and now we'll log in in order to to the desktop in order to open the the app. Sorry for that. As you see, we use a long, complicated <laughs> password. That was password one, two, three, twice, wasn't it? 
<laughs> Actually, no. <laughs> Even for demo, we use very complicated passwords. So here um, we open the AnyDisk app. Let's check the process that it's all running. PS minus AUX ref AnyDesk. Okay. Good looking. Now we will check the open ports. Next step. Minus TUNLP. We'll grip again the AnyDesk. Okay, and as we can see, there's a UDP port open 50001. And this is great because this is the port we will be using for the attack. So now we'll uh, be using the frame rope of the Metasploit. So let's open that in the sub console. Yeah, it, it's also refreshing to know that single packet UDP exploits still exist. Uh, <laughs> well, there was a TCP <laughs> framework uh, that had it in it, Ripple 20, and we covered it last week. So it's good. Great examples. Love it. <laughs> so here we'll be using the CVE 2020 13160 of any desk. And let's use the show options command to see which option we should set. So as we see, we're missing the host and the target is not the target we are using because it's Ubuntu 24 instead of 18.04. Um, let's set that up. So set our hosts. Turn 0.327. And let's look at the list of targets. So sure. Okay, so the ID we need is one. Let's set that. Okay, just let's have a quick look to see that all the options are correct now. Okay, looking perfect. Let's try an exploit. Okay, so now we can open a shell and execute a command such as hosting. Okay, so now we received the attack. Um, the attack hostname, uh, Ubuntu 18.04 exploit, and this is great. Uh, if we were an attacker now, we could have exploit, uh, sorry, we could have uh, um, used a malicious command instead. And so let's talk about this um, attack, what happened here. So what is exactly this format string and why is it risky? So a format string exploit occurs when the submitted data of an input string is evaluated as a command by the application. In this way, the attacker could execute code, read the stack, or cause a segmentation fall in the running application. The attack could be executed when the application doesn't properly validate the submitted input. For example, if a format string parameter like um, percent %x is inserted, it will be converted into a format, and the argument, arguments that are not supplied would be instead read or write from the stack. So in order to see exactly what this vulnerable function is doing, uh, we implemented a simple, a simple uh, code that can demonstrate it and we can uh, debug it together. So let's look at that code. We called it a tab. And if you can see on my screen, uh, what this code does, it asks for the secret key and uh, prints out if it's true or not and prints also the secret key. So, uh, I mean, the secret key that was entered. So let's try it out. So uh, at first I put a false secret, my secret, for example. And if you can see my screen, so my secret isn't the secret. And now we will try the uh, valid code. So one level one. And you're right. 
So now for the demonstration, I would like to enter percentage P. Uh, this is uh, a formatting of a pointer. Sorry. We'll do that many times in order to receive what we want from this tab. Okay, and we received here all kind of hexadecimal numbers that we can convert into ASCII. I'm sorry, this is wrong. And we received our password out of the stack. So actually what this um, demonstration shows us is that using this uh, vulnerability, we can um, receive uh, data from the stack or even write to the stack like they did in any desk uh, vulnerability. And now we would like to debug this uh, program, but because of the time limit, it would be hard for us just to start from uh, without any hint. Um, so we will use kind of an open source that here will shorten the path and for us helps us to scale. Uh, it's a WE checker that we will run on this code on the attack code, and we will wish that we would give us a hint for where to start debug. So meanwhile, WE, uh, CWE Checker is an open source um, for um, uh, discovering common bug classes. And in this case, it found our, uh, uh, our uh, function, the SNPrintF, the dangerous function that is vulnerable. Um, and Roy, can you please uh, now debug this function? Yeah, sure. So um, as Shani uh, presented, um, essentially, uh, there was the vulnerability in AnyDesk where, uh, again, the UDP packet which was sent was triggering. Um, eventually, it got to a, a vulnerable risky function. Um, and by facilitating the format string feature, so to speak. It was uh, allowing the, the adversary to write on, uh, on some locations on the memory space of, of any desk, uh, shell code, and eventually let us to do some, uh, you know, accomplish a malicious activity. So Roy, what we want I'm, to show I'm here- sure the, uh, I'm sure the any desk developers like to think of it as a feature and not a bug. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> um, so let me just connect to this computer and let's do a, a somewhat of a debugging. Um, so I will be sharing, of course, my screen here. It's any desk admin mode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, anywhere, admin, whoever. <laughs> so um, let's see here what, how it goes. I know there's some, I need to connect here again. Okay, so um, let's put it aside for a moment. Okay, just log in. Cool. That's no longer needed. Um, so what we're gonna do next again is we are going to simulate the attack. Okay, so let's run that. Okay, the attack is running. Now it's waiting for user input, so there's no, uh, there are no issues here we can attach to the process. So again, let's do that. Open the, um, it will be using EDB uh, debugger. Okay, and we need to run with the elevated user because uh, we are debugging the root process. Um, so let's do that and attach the process. Okay, so let's do that. So we are now attached. Uh, let's uh, continue the execution. Um, so as Jenny showed us uh, using the CWE uh, checker, uh, we found that there is a potentially use of a dangerous function, sprintf, sprintf. Um, so what we're going to do is basically place a, a uh, toggle a breakpoint there and to see see how it goes once we get uh, to that uh, risky function. So let's go to the simple viewer, type in S and print F. We see it's being used in our code. So let's double click that and then um, toggle a uh, breakpoint. Here we go. Um, and we are, we are running. Great. So let's get back to this uh, small simulation. Um, 
and type in eight times uh, this parameter. Again, it's a reference for a pointer. I hope you're counting because I'm not. <laughs> one, two, three, four. Okay, I think we should be, let's have one vision just for a case. In any case, uh, okay, so we type in the, the, the input which will trigger uh, that uh, vulnerability and we hit the breakpoint. As you can see in the register, we have the input which was placed. Mm -hmm. And uh, by uh, moving forward, um, I will skip this execution. Okay, no need to go to dwell into that. Okay, so um, by examining, um, let's see, I'm not in a breakpoint. By examining the stack, I can show that um, we have, um, okay, we have that um, string enumerated. As you can see in the stack, this is also equivalent for, for what Shani showed us before. Okay, it's the same string essentially. Now, I just wanted to show that the content is basically uh, parameters from the stack because we didn't, didn't provide any external uh, parameters for it to build the string from. So what it does, it just goes to the stack and just pulls one by one. And on the eighth attempt, it actually reaches the uh, 31 um, uh, hex code, which is the uh, the number one of, of our uh, of our password. So just looking at the uh, on the last four, you can see we got the, the one which ends with 31, uh, OX1, 100, and 728. If we're going down the stack, you can see that uh, uh, of our uh, password, which is stored here, is actually the last parameter, which was printed before we got the 01 the 100 and 728. So as we can see, the format string uh, builder was actually taking the input from the stack and giving us an option to, uh, to get a hold of, of the password of the memory. Now, obviously doing that one by one for every application and uh, you know, trying to accomplish this, it's not scalable. Um, and doing a manual process, I remember days I was spending for, you know, for identifying vulnerabilities, it's quite, uh, quite tough. So uh, I let you need to describe a bit how this kind of process could be done on a scalable manner. Unless you have any questions, I'll be happy to take, you know, uh, in regards. Right, um, EDB, uh, the debugger provided the command line and the graphical interface? Uh, yeah, it's both. Okay. Uh, the command line, uh, no, the, it's not a command line debugger, it's a visual debugger. Yeah, um, I got you. But you uh, started, I see, from the command line and it spawned the graphical debugger? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, okay. I spawned it, and because there is an fget function, so basically it waits for a user, so there's no, there's no issue here to attach. Usually, if you have like a quick process which just get you know, loaded enough, it could be tricky there, but here there is a, it's waiting for a user input, so there's no, you know, we can gotcha. take our time and attach, yeah. Yep, awesome. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I'll hand over the mic to Shani to discuss a bit about uh, scannable ways to do, yeah, to find vulnerabilities. Thanks, Roy. So uh, as we saw, discovering vulnerabilities using a debugger is a time consuming, even when we use the small example and most softwares are much complicated than this, than this simple example we, we implemented. And as an attacker, it might be enough to find one or few exploits, but uh, from the protection point of view, we need to find all the vulnerability or at least to try to find all the vulnerabilities that exist. And, um, and uh, to find them before the attacker does. So due to the increase in the vulnerabilities and of the attack, so we need to find a much scalable way um, to do this uh, process. Um, and there are some kind of different tools that are developed uh, in the market, and some of them are even open source. We would be happy to mention a bit. Uh, so for static binary analysis that models the assembly code and produces graphs such as control flow, data flow, control dependency graphs. Uh, we can use ANGR, Radar2. Um, there are different techniques such as Fathers. Uh, this is an automating software testing technique, uh, automatically providing invalid, unexpected, or random data as an input to computer programs. And, check its behavior. Um, such we can find as AFL or as espousing. Um, and of course, there's the third technique of, uh, of um, looking for CWE uh, detection, uh, such as the one that we detected. Uh, it, these are common bad, uh, bad classes that could be found in softwares. Um, and we can get hints or even maybe find vulnerabilities using these techniques. 
So, you know, Paul, um, these tools are now maybe help us to scale the process, but this is not enough if we're looking about the future and the upcoming days. So we, we think that we would be having uh, much more vulnerabilities and we are looking for um, even innovative techniques for that. And we can see that all kinds of researchers all around the world are looking into how to apply machine learning techniques in these tools in order for us, you know, to go to the future and still could be able to detect them before the attackers does. Um, yeah, and Sean, I, really I think the, you know, the tools that you mentioned are helping automate tasks in the vulnerability discovery process for a researcher, right? And where you and team have taken it is really to that machine learning and, and automating uh, uh, many of those, the discovery of many of those techniques, right? And that's where I kind of see that, right. that shift. Right, exactly, exactly. So we see just like uh, state of the art researches that were published lately. Uh, we can see all kind of uh, researches through CWE detection methods. Um, while uh, the limitation with the current tools, as you said, is that they're based on existing patterns. On um, they are created by experts. Uh, they require time, effort, cost. It's hard to keep them up to date with every vulnerability that uh, that is discovered and. Researchers are now proposing a new method of using machine, machine learning sorry, uh, to model assembly code and using the algorithm that is based on word to vec and they learn the features of the software weakness code using these feature extraction of text CNN without creating patterns or rules. So this will allow us to detect new software weaknesses. Other researchers uh, can predict, show that they can predict dangerous memory corruption. They use, you know, they extract static features by uh, looking into the sequences of calls to the standard C library functions in the program, and they treat them, uh, they trace as a, sorry, and they trace and they treat each call trace as a text document. Then they can vectorize the data using the text mining techniques such as n-grams and word to vec and predict program that contain dangerous memory corruption. So, yeah, there's a lot of challenges with these uh, new techniques. Um, there are still most of the tools today support source code and not binary code. And as we know, vendors can might use these techniques before they publish the, the uh, software, but we, in our uh, state of mind, we look onto binary code. Also, most of the binaries might be too large uh, to be useful uh, in like the practical inspection. Uh, we could have uh, computational um, challenges and also uh, sometimes the environment where the binary is running is different than looking in a, in a static method. So yeah, we're always looking into new and innovative techniques in order to help us you know, overcome these challenges and be able to predict all these vulnerabilities in advance. So the prediction and patchless protection, right, which I did want to touch on a little bit, because not only do you identify these vulnerabilities, but you're able to um, Patch is the wrong word, I think, is what we uh, agreed upon, right? It's not really a patch, really just in-memory protection for this specific vulnerability rather than a very generic memory protection, which is, you know, prone to false positive and false negatives. You can provide a very uh, specific memory protection. But getting back to the discovery of the vulnerabilities, these don't have to be zero-day vulnerabilities, right? These can be a vulnerability that's been released and you can still use the same method, especially since the patch is released, to identify that vulnerability. Is that correct? Yeah, that actually makes life easier. If you have a uh, public disclosure, and even better, if you have an exploit and the patch, you know, this is kind of um, what allows you to be, first, let's imagine you predicted the vulnerability. Um, then it allows you to know if you were, if you were right, you know, if you are um, uh, hitting on the spot. And then in terms, um, if your protection was effective as, as for example, as for the patch. So, um, so yeah, this is actually something which, which, is, which is helping, of course. That's awesome. Tyler, Lee, more questions? So, so I was thinking that uh, you're, you've, you've got some ideas. I'm thinking, but you've got an extreme scaling challenge. How, how are you looking to really scale 
to get to get all that detection and uh, identification done in a in a rapid fashion, or or is that one of your hard problems you're still trying to solve? So it's a good it's a good point here. Um, yeah. So in terms of scaling, the I think this is kind of the main driver for us to start off binary analysis rather than trying to emulate stuff in memory. Um, so it's give you know it's good for, to some extent allow you to to find some issues like we saw just here. Uh, giving you some hints about potential potential issues. Um, so binary analysis, uh, the way they do it, we do it today is quite efficient. Um, it's a few, um, up to a minute, it's, it's a, a manner of seconds to minutes for us to identify a given uh, binary based on the techniques that we support, of course. Um, but it's a good point that once we would like to uh, to extend the reach for things which are a bit more dynamic, like uh, let's say uh, uh, supervised fuzzing or um, some more deep, you know, eventually when you do also binary analysis, there is some limitation on the recursion level. How deep are you getting? Um, so yes, we we saw these limitations and we are uh, unveiling always new ways to to overcome these. But it's it's a good it's a good question uh, and obviously it's a limitation for why not to apply all the techniques at once on every application? It's something that definitely requires significant computational resources. Well, I was actually also wondering if, you know, if you found something, say at Paul's company, would you then shortcut the process at my company to discover if we have the same issue to worry about? So because it's a binary analysis, eventually the same and the techniques that we, we do today are not uh, based on you know environmental changes. If we found uh, a given binary, uh, well, we found a vulnerability on, on company A and it's the same hash for company B, then assuming they have you know they have the file, we found the hash there, so we can just uh, we can spare the the analysis there. We can just show okay, these are the results for that hash. Obviously, once we're going to introduce dynamic features, it will be different. Some of the assessments will be needed to be done again and again for every client. But for the binary analysis, that's correct. Uh, it's not needed to duplicate the same results. Nice. Yeah, because so, it seemed like, go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> no, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to I was just kind of, uh, I was kind of curious around the, the idea of where you're doing the static binary analysis, is there, uh, is there the potential to do dynamic binary analysis in memory as the binary is being loaded or as the operating system is getting ready to execute it and kind of ana analyze that as it's being uh, utilized? Similar to what you did with the breakpoint, right? Uh, is there future plans where you can look at the binary in memory as it's running and identify a potential, potentially dangerous uh, functions being called with that binary? Yeah, so uh, it's a great point. Uh, I think without stealing the, the thunder of the patchless uh, protection uh, <laughs> session, um, I can say that we are using for the in-memory <laughs> protection, we use the dynamic binary instrumentation, uh, which traditionally was used for debugging. Um, mm -hmm. And we kind of uh, heavily tweaked that to be adjusted for security without the significant impact on performance, because as you know, when you debug a process, then you know it's quite chaotic and what goes there. Um, <laughs> so we are facilitating dynamic binary instrumentation techniques to do the protection. But of course, in terms, it could be um, used for doing uh, uh, the dynamic analysis. So uh, that's a good point. And this is definitely a, a space we are deeply looking into. Um, look, there are so many techniques for us to, to uh, try to find vulnerabilities from. Um, so it's a matter of priorities. Uh, once we get to the dynamic, there is, a, of course, a question of which machine you would like to evaluate because some vulnerabilities could be represented on the server rather than on a desktop, um, on machine A rather than machine B. So it's also a question not if you can accomplish it, but also where and when. Um, but it, it's a good point. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what's, what's the impact of the analysis on the end known, whether it's a workstation or a server? Uh, uh, what you know? How much? How much is the overhead for doing this? I mean, it seems like it wouldn't be horrible, but you wonder. Yeah. So all of the analysis is being done uh, on our on the server side. So uh, okay. it means that the tenant, assuming the hash wasn't uploaded from anywhere else, uh, from a customer's, uh, you know, globally, um, assuming the hash wasn't uh, already analyzed, then um, the server is smart enough to pick and choose which computers need to upload based on their uh, consumption, based on their performance. It would basically copy the binary 
to an, a ser, uh, analysis on the server side. Then it will do the assessment over the binary and remove the file because we have the results. There's no need to do another assessment uh, at that point. Uh, so there's no uh, computational uh, resources or impact required from the from the end node. It's more of the server side. It's mainly you know copy a file to to the server. That's it. Yeah. So you, be... you guys <clears throat> you guys built cloud first, right? And uh, everything goes up into your cloud for analysis, which means the user can be anywhere. Yeah, I think this is also something which is quite. Uh, uh, we put a lot of effort into. Imagine uh, having. Uh, in a, today with the remote work folks and people working from home, you want to have a visibility, they installing stuff from wherever, whenever. I think uh, we have a few clients which kind of uh, lift the levers and they, every user now got an admin because it's very hard to support them globally. Um, imagine mm -hmm. someone taking a laptop back home and he needs a new software. Imagine pushing a new software there. Imagine uh, seeing what's going on. So. Um, Cloud first is something we um, uh, had, you know, very deep into our core. The ability to um, to break the perimeter and to basically support everywhere and anywhere. Um, also, in the sense of analysis, uh, analyzing and predicting vulnerabilities. And I think maybe speaking of which, maybe I can show a bit how it's being um, represented on the dashboard. If we have a couple yeah. of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not going through a full demo, but um, basically, as you can see, the system um, gives like an overview of all the threats. It's real-time visibility. All of the threats that are uh, shown for um, for a given uh, environment, I and found these many vulnerabilities and and potential hints and issues that uh, I found in the code. Obviously, there will be exponentially more unknown threats than known. That makes mm -hmm. perfect sense. Um, and uh, once we would like to go specifically for any desk, um, here we can get to the operational screen. Uh, so we got any desk and examining the analysis, definitely we can go and see uh, there is this um, uh, the version which is which is vulnerable, uh, format string vulnerability, which allows an LCE remote code execution. Um, but also examining the zero day frame, this is uh, the result of the binary analysis. Obviously, we're not going to be an exploit uh, factory <laughs> that people can be used that for their own uh, malicious intents. We're well, like uh, obfuscating that and giving like a general category of what could be found. Um, so we are um, telling the client, look, you, there is an option here to exfiltrate data. Uh, we found uh, 19 functions which are related to that. And then the now what question is being asked. Once we get to the patchless protection session, of course, we're going to discuss that. But the first, the goal here is to show a client, look, even if there is or there isn't a known vulnerability, still there is something here which in turn can be used against you. So you can have the upper hand. You can have the prior knowledge before waiting for, again, for a public CVE to be disclosed. So this is, again, what we're trying to show here. That's mm -hmm. really awesome. Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and that's and and that's prioritized, like how in the in the interface, right? Like your the zero. Let's just say that in any desk it was a zero day, right? Like mm -hmm. how do you? What are the other uh, items that you're prioritizing around uh, in any desk zero day exploit, as an example, in in someone's environment? Yeah, obviously for a zero day exploit, there is no. Um... There is no CVSS score, mm. obviously. There is no vector which we can rely on. I think with the Michael's session, he kind of discussed of how we parse the vector and try to connect the dots, like if an, a vulnerability requires um, high privileges, we check if the process is running with the high privileges uh, um, on, the, on a given machine. Um, it's not this, these data points are not available on a zero day. What is available are somewhat dynamic uh, properties which can be facilitated, for example, um, Imagine we have a vulnerability we found around um, um, network activity, network-related attacks. We have some categories, some of them related to that. So if the application is not actively you know, communicating with, network, with the network, obviously the zero day, the vulnerability we found has uh, less importance. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is, a, there is a vulnerability, there is a domain of attack we found around the, the world of, of network, but the application isn't communicating with, you know, it's not networkly active. So obviously the weight, there is an, we are associating weights, so, th so the weights associated with the risk of that giving zero day is significantly lower than other things that we find. Right, and what I like about the Vicarious platform is I don't have to tell it a whole lot, right? Like you give me a very subjective risk score, as you said, this process is communicating on the network or it's not, right? 
and then there's the automatic context that you're putting it in. You know, it is talking on the network, but it's not exposed to the internet or it is, right? And you're doing all of that calculation for me and finding vulnerabilities that are potential zero days. And I can just go into the interface and see what's most important to me on any given day at any given time, correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. I think this is uh, uh, what we try to accomplish is to be first a unified um, uh, platform to from the point of disclosure for finding the vulnerability again known or unknown through the decision making process we know this is something which takes a lot of time from companies to try to know okay there are so many vulnerabilities and uh, uh, try to pick and choose the one you should be focusing and putting into your plan of, uh, of fixes um, and eventually fixing it so there is always like there are always gaps when you do a scan and you you manually try to prioritize or to try to utilize some tools um, and then try to shift the, let's say, the responsibility for someone else to take, you know, to take ownership of the process to fix it, and then try to do the loop back. Um, so, what was important for us was to be able to 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 show the alert, to focus on the ones who matter, but also provide the mitigation. So, I think while we are quite um, speaking of identifying or uh, finding like vulnerable spots. We are quite, uh, um, we, let's say we are faster there in the process of finding new techniques and, and, and facilitating them. Um, the protection obviously takes a bit more cautious because you cannot just do whatever you want. You need to be testing techniques. So we're trying to, um, when we find an issue, we, we work very hard to make sure we can offer a mitigation as well. Not just, again, bombarding clients with alerts they have nothing they can do about. So when we introduce a new technique to find vulnerabilities, um, we usually release it when there is a, um, actually a protection manner which you can, can be applied upon. This is in relation to the patches protection. Um, so this is how we try to close the circle. You know, you find stuff, you prioritize based on a vast majority of, of uh, indicators. It could be external facing, it could be dynamic, like how the application is being used, what is the token, uh, which ports are open, how, who is it communicating with. Uh, there's a lot of data points we are collecting and facilitating into that. So two questions. <clears throat> Go ahead, Lee. Uh, so when you identify the risk, do I have visibility to the information behind that risk level? As you had mentioned, there were indicators you found. Can I, as a customer, see what they are? And the second question is, can I recast the risk based on my situation? So today, um, in, in the sense of uh, um, looking on the risk, there is um, um, a technique we call, the, we call it XTAG, which is basically exploitation tags. Uh, we are tagging the data, uh, the data points, which are either external um, or internal. So we are tagging the data points in relation to the application. Imagine you have, um, let's say, a Java application. Mm -hmm. um, so this Java can be deployed, and this is a true story. Uh, let's say you have a, a infrastructure, like a farm, server farm of a thousand uh, computers. Um, and Java, let's say, is installed on each and every one of them. Um, right. And every other day there is an update. Uh, not every other day. Let's let's give them some credit. But there are a lot of uh, a lot of patches released uh, over time. Um, mm -hmm. And then we had a client which actually was you know initiating a new patching cycle uh, for a thousand seats over and over and over. Um, and when we deploy the system, one of the I think one of the interesting data points that we show is, for instance, if an application is not loaded to memory. So imagine now you have Java on a thousand computers. You are maintaining it for years, right? You are updating and trying to fix it. Uh, mainly the driver there was security, not features. The application is running, but they're trying to just to keep it uh, up to date and secure. Um, and when we uh, deployed that, we saw that around 80% of the, the servers were not using the Java whatsoever. So the Java worker was never loaded to memory. Therefore, it was not used. Uh, so imagine how much, well, at least he cannot, he, not saying to uninstall it, of course, but at least he can just to focus on the ones who actually use the, the you know, use the, the application. So this tag has a weight associated with it. And assuming it's met, you know, uh, we found the the, uh, the criteria which we are checking, uh, it could either increase or decrease the risk. So you as a user, you can filter by any given indicator that we provide, but altogether we are providing an algorithm, like a battle-proof uh, scoring system, which is tested throughout from SMEs to Fortune 500 companies. Um, so today we're bringing it out of the box, but uh, in the future you will be able to adjust it. And imagine, Lee, that you can take a risk model that you have today. Mm -hmm. Some of the bigger companies have a risk model. Um, yeah. Imagine you can adjust it 
not saying, okay, uh, having a risk model, and then there is a lot of effort needed to be, uh, to be synced or to change it. You can adjust it on the spot and then see how the entire risk of the company change based upon your, uh, your decision. For instance, if something that has an exploit now should be uh, super high categorized, and then you know what, not having an exploit, maybe something which is weaponized and is not uh, communicating with the internet. So you will have the luxury to change the risk model based on your need and in real time. So it sounds like I could really make the argument about taking action because I could show what would happen more easily if we don't, which would be good for supporting the uh, our argument from the security team when talking to management that is not quite as hip to the consequences of the decision pro or con. That would be huge. Yeah, imagine, yeah, exactly. Having not, no need to fight with the CIO or the CEO, depends on the size of the company, why you didn't patched your seven zip. So, um, mm-hmm. Oh, we'll still fight with them. <laughs> well, that's what I like too. The, the term patch less is overloaded in the context of vicarious, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a big risk. You can look in different ways, patch less or the patch less technology. Definitely. Right. What we had in mind. It's awesome. Uh, for folks that want to learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash vicarious. You can start your 30, uh, 30 day free trial today uh, by submitting some basic information. Uh, and if you want to check it out, kick the tires on it. Uh, I highly recommend that you do. Uh, you folks are doing great work. Roy and Shani, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, Thanks, Tyler, and thank you. Thanks, Tyler and Lee, and thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. We'll see you next time over and out.